social media, uh, what about that? We, we all know them by now. We carry them around in our pockets. We have them in our tablets, in our laptops. It's these little icons that we click on and these uh, websites we visit. They're all over the place. And they are tools. They are tools for creativity. They can be tools for learning. They can be tools for entertainment. They can be tools for bridging geographical, cultural distances that were sort of impossible nearly to bridge uh, in such an efficient, efficient way only a couple of decades ago. So social media can be a lot of things. It can be uh, a lot of good things. It can enhance democracy. It can uh, further learning processes. It might boost the power of social movements. Social media might be enlightening, like Wikipedia is an amazing project in many ways. Social media can also maybe build uh, diversity and tolerance, like today. In today's world, we encounter a large number of different perspectives, points of view, that we didn't in a pre-digital world, and we are somehow forced, at least to some extent, to, to relate to all of these and to navigate these. So we maybe could argue that we will become better people. But also we are taught that uh, social media can be problematic. They can enclose us in these filter bubbles where we become very narrow-minded, less in touch with reality than we were before. They can be tools for surveillance in this top-down manner. They can be platforms for deploying things like cyberbullying, hate speech, things like that. They can also be tools for this raging capitalist system that we have, where we, our every move is tracked, every preference we have is logged, and these targeted ads are pushed out to us. We're expected to be affected by them, to click them, and to thereby perform this free digital labor that is debated today. So social media can be a lot of things. But what if I told you that there are no social media? Because in fact, if we see media as social, that is in fact a case of technological determinism. And that's not a good thing, <laughs> I would say, because if we say that, that media are technologies, and if we say that media are social, it assumes that they have some sort of agency, or at least that they can achieve stuff. They can do things. For example, to take but one example, like we buy a bunch of laptops, and we hand them out to high school students, and we say, look, it's a digital school, go have fun. But maybe there's no thinking. I'm not saying this is always the case, but no pedagogical thinking, no idea about how this transformation is supposed to take place. So there are lots of examples that illustrate how we sort of expect so social transformations to follow from the mere fact that technology is in place. And that's technological determinism. So I would say then that media as such are never social but people can be sometimes. And when people are doing social things on these platforms, they can do this in a wide variety of ways. And another problem apart from technological determinism is the fact that we tend to, and now I'm speaking basically for media scholars in academia, which is the field where I sort of have the overview, but I think it's a, a, a wider problem, more far-reaching than that, that we tend to forget that different ways of communicating, old ways and new ways of communicating, coexist at the same time. So if I give you like the basic level of communication studies in a few seconds here, we, we teach students this. A hundred years ago, communication was believed to be a very simple process. The message was going from the sender to the receiver. This was truly the age of no filter, so to speak. Nothing happened in between. 
So this is a sort of brainwash model, a propaganda model, if you will, that's not very big on complexity or dynamics, which says that's that the things that are sent out are the things received, basically. Then around 60 years ago, in communication studies, this was replaced by a new theory that became widely used, which is a two-step model, saying that, well, of course, the message gets from the sender to the receiver, but it's mediated somehow, socially, by people, by these dots in the middle. Opinion leaders, they're called like engaged citizens, the, the dominant people in the coffee rooms in your offices that take in all this information from different sources, do stuff with it, repackage it, and sort of re-communicate it, recirculate it. So thereby people can get information in two ways, directly from media and from these opinion leaders. Then around 40 years ago, we speak of the cultural turn in media studies, and then a theory about what's called encoding and decoding became the new thing which is about the fact that uh, content, a message, can be encoded by the originator of this message with some sort of preferred meaning. But then it's decoded in innumerable ways by different people in different contexts, like depending on your social class, your gender uh, identity, your uh, ethnicity, your sexual identity. Lots of things about your position that makes this message sort of land in different ways, meaning different things. Around 10 years ago, there was a major change towards focusing on what's called participatory culture. And in this world, everyone is a sender, everyone is a receiver. Distinctions like the one between producer and consumer, between teacher and student, between journalist and citizen, between expert and amateur, between psychologist and patient, all of these things like out the window. So the problem here, what we fail to realize today, is that this very basic point that these things actually coexist all at the same time. And, and that uh, leaves us with a very complex uh, communication landscape, so to speak. And I think you can relate to this. Somehow, sometimes we just sit on a couch, watch TV, and we sit down and are told stuff. Maybe we tweet sometimes, like talking back to this thing that we see like in a football game or the Eurovision Song Contest or something. But a lot of the time, we just sit down and are told stuff. But still, we get information from, from these opinion leaders around us. We still decode things depending on our positions. And we also, to varying degrees, participate in producing this user-generated content. And this is happening all at the same time. So these different complexities, all of these things I've been talking about this far, is why technological determinism doesn't work. Because technologies, in this case we're speaking of communication platforms, they don't get universal, uh, homogenous, and sort of unified consequences. It can vary by context. So, for this reason, I think that both from the perspective of business, from the perspective of research and relating to our everyday general understanding of these things. We need better methods and more sophisticated analytical tools for realizing not how social media works, because I just told you that they don't exist, but for how social uses of media work. So I will give you now four examples from my own research um, around these themes, sentiment, interaction, time and dynamics to show you how I think this complexity actually plays out and how we can get to it somehow. So sentiment first. This is from a study of YouTube videos. So from the top to bottom here we have four different video genres. News videos, music videos, that's Justin Bieber up there, and uh, a gaming tutorial video, and a video showing you how to solve the Rubik's Cube. The thing here is that the two top ones are sort of produced according to the mass communication paradigm. We have media corporations posting these, producing these, pushing them out according to that logic. The two bottom ones are user-produced content. So, and they are ranked here by the number of views they have on YouTube. If we instead rank them by how many people put the thumbs up on them on YouTube, it switches around a bit. And when we did a sentiment analysis, which is a linguistic method for 
measuring emotional content in texts, in this case in comments to the YouTube videos, we found that the most positive emotions were found in relation to the user-generated videos. So the point here is that depending on the questions we ask, depending on how we define the ways in which they should be responded to, answered, uh, we will find that user-generated content is less powerful or more powerful. So the research method is very important. This was a study of um, the Libyan uprising during the Arab Spring, the most frequently occurring Twitter accounts during the, during the first 24 hours of the revolution there. We found that big media accounts, government accounts, and social movement accounts were the most prominent. So this then could lead us to conclude that social media didn't make much of a difference, because it's still the traditional actors that have power. This is just a new channel for communicating in the same way. But when we looked at interactivity, the, the direction of communication, the places where messages were going both ways, this happened among the activists, between the individuals that were peripheral in the first setting. So where we direct this searchlight affects what we see. This was a forum, support forum online for victims of domestic violence. We found there, not very surprisingly, some people were giving support, some were receiving support, taking support, some were doing a little bit of both. That's not very revolutionary. But it becomes a bit more interesting when we added the dimension of time, because then we found that new participants were the ones seeking for help, and the experienced participants were those mainly giving this help. So we found this community to be something that represented a sort of learning process where you come there, searching for help, gradually learn to help others when you're helped yourself. So it's like on the airplane, like the oxygen mask, first yourself, then help others. Finally, Facebook groups. Let's say Facebook groups with uh, 100,000 users. Even though it's the same technology, the same platform, Facebook groups, the same number of users, they can be very different from each, from each other. Very different in terms of their network dynamics. The McDonald's Facebook page, if analyzed closer, is a highly centralized page in terms of its communication model. We find that it's the company in the middle doing most of the posting, basically all of it, pushing it out to a number of users, randomly just being there, liking the odd thing sometimes. But it's not a tight-knit network. It's a mass communication model happening on what we assume to be a social medium. The American Democratic Party has a decentralized page, page with these opinion leaders talking to different fractions. So that's a completely different communication model with the same number of people on the same platform. The Occupy movement has this distributed communication model where lots of people are equally active, all of them interacting, both sending and receiving. So this, once again then, shows the problem with technological determinism because we have the same technology, a Facebook page, a social medium represented here by the example of the Facebook page, but three different communication models. So once again, media, the platforms are not social, but sometimes people are, sometimes people put them to social uses. So this is me saying basically then, to repeat it once more, media are not social, people are sometimes. And we have been guessing now for 10 years, I would say, at least from the place where I'm standing, that's how it looks in research, guessing about the consequences of these digitally networked media. There's the utopians and the dystopians. And we need a, a middle ground here. We need to see how do these media actually work to stop theorizing and start researching, developing methods and analytical tools. And this is what we're doing uh, in my research group at Umeå University. So, you're welcome to look us up, and thank you for listening.